work we live with today. Um, I'd like to shift now a little bit in tone. Um, so we've shown you how grim the situation is and I'd like to put some light onto moments of resistance. Um, and I'd like to start with Ned, actually. Um, Ned, you were talking, you, you started your talk with a sentence which you borrowed by Hitler, logistical media determines our situation. Um, but throughout when you were talking, you were sort of wondering the site of struggle is at once ever present and now where to be found. Um, and you were talking about black, black, black box politics. Um, so. Where would you see um, that resistance or struggle of resistance comes in? Where, where does our work start? Yeah, th thanks very much. I mean, the Kittler um, instance of plagiarism was kind of an up update, right, rather than, yeah. than you know. Um, then sites of struggle, well, you know, I think Trevor has done a wonderful job in identifying some of these. And, and when I'm thinking of, of it being present but, but nowhere to be found, then we're talking about kind of parametric politics, if you like, um, uh, parametric architectures. But, you know, okay, so let's, let's put it another way. Um, the sites of struggle are kind of really clear in some ways. They're these infrastructural installations, at least for the research we've been doing on ports, on intermodal terminals, um, and hopefully soon on, on data centers. So we know what they are, but they're impenetrable, right, because of the type of proprietary um, economies, regulations around them. So then, we're also engaged in other kinds of infrastructural formation. We, we may invent infrastructures. I think platform cooperation is a, um, uh, an example of that. Another is the fact that if you subtract these infrastructures of um, impenetrability, um, uh, also these kind of a, uh, adjacent external infrastructures disappear, namely, right, the kind of um, uh, informal economies around um, uh, scrap metal workers, let's say, that we saw in Piraeus in Athens, um, the sabotage of infrastructure that we see in Rajahat outside of Kolkata. I mean, these also are kind of infrastructures, if you like, um, and they're ones that you know people can have some kind of degree of um, 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 self-definition of. Mm. So these are, uh, you know, obviously sites of struggle and um, uh, spaces of conflict, um, uh, and they're graspable. Um, the extent to which we might um, mess with the algorithmic architectures um, of, say, um, enterprise planning systems is another matter altogether. Mm -hmm. Historically, this has happened, indeed, in, in Dortmund, in, in Germany, in 1992. I gather that uh, one of the algorithmic lines determining um, uh, the time, real-time pressures on labor was hacked by uh, activist kind of programmers, and they kind of rewrote that line. So that's also possible, but infrequently uh, uh, impossible, I think. Um, Trevor, you had a, an example that you were saying about the um, platform cooperatism. Maybe you can um, explain a little bit more to all of us what you mean by this and what could be an example. I think you're building something in the direction. Well, after I wrote, um, I guess out of this conference uh, in last November and then out of this uh, text that I read to you, uh, came an initiative to actually uh, try to build something like that. So the idea to actually uh, think like, so what do they actually have? What do companies like Uber or all these other apps-based labor brokerages, what do they have that a worker cooperative could not, or just a peer-run business uh, could not reach, right? And of course they have uh, marketing efforts that uh, you can hardly match, but otherwise you could easily, I mean, you, you can, it is not impossible, right, to build an app that would actually allow something to happen that is quite similar to what happens on Odesk or what happens on uh, Topcoder, TaskRabbit, uh, that is not really not unthinkable. So we're talking with uh, Google developers and a group of civic hackers and technologists in New York City to uh, we will have our uh, first meeting uh, next week to actually think about is a, a possibility to to build an uh, open source uh, piece of software into which you could plug in various services, you know, like domestic labor uh, with companies like Hand, uh, with Handy, I think it's called, and others, uh, uh, taxi business, taxi services, uh, and other uh, businesses to actually rival those uh, middlemen and take them out of the equation. Uh, but I think there are other uh, uh, points as well. How long will the project? 
I hope it's all like far, uh, far too early uh, in the planning. But I think there are it's like sort of more in the larger picture there, I think the, the problem that we are seeing in the US at least is that there's basically this move away from employment to this, what I don't know, what some people call the gig economy or a much more precarious uh, co uh, um, contingent uh, working arrangement. And uh, so I think to encounter that, you, uh, c I think it would really help to change the definition of employment to actually uh, um, le legally change what it means to be an employer and uh, to basically embrace all the rights, you know, because that's a huge thing about losing employment is that you actually lose like a large number of rights that were, you know, that the labor movement fought over for like at least a hundred years, right? Like people died for the stuff, right? The eight hour work day, uh, workplace discrimination, uh, all of that stuff, right? And so how do you get any, some of these rights back for these contingent workers, at least some of these rights, right? Because they are really completely powerless or they, there's no uh, mm. legal protection. Um, now I'm struggling in myself what I have to ask first. Maybe I, I think it's an important point. I want to make it um, a bit more clear maybe, but um, how many of us are on a permanent contract? That's about... <laughs> Trevor says that's Germany. <laughs> Well, I would say if that's Germany, then good night, rest of the world. Um, so we see there's something really important going on. And I was wondering, I mean, it was very clear that, Laurel, your project hit a nerve. Um, how important can art be or what can art do um, here to, I mean, we, we talked about struggles and situations that are not visible, that are, seem to be sort of suppressed. Um, what can be the role of art? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, for me, I found art with the question of digital labor to be an important site of helping kind of incite maybe something like an imagination of refusal <laughs> or an imagination um, of how one is implicated in these kinds of systems. Um, I think that, I don't know, I guess for me, I, I'm someone who reads the work of people like Trevor and that very closely and carefully and feel really inspired by it. But I also see a gulf between, um, you know, who can take in that kind of knowledge and information um, and how things are circulated in an academic or even an artistic context. I guess what I try to think about is almost like how can I help to translate that to have a different kind of audience or a broader audience or to kind of expand who can sort of understand these dynamics. Um, and I think for me, um, using these kinds of more creative or artistic procedures and modes of entering the question has uh, made me feel like I can have this conversation with a much wider um, group of people than I could have otherwise had. Uh, I think art is also really interesting to think about in relationship to things like algorithms or metadata and things that we experience with a very high degree of abstraction because in a way art is about um, giving a kind of visual presence to things um, and it's almost in a way like um, for me I guess a question of how can you um, visually or materially sort of bring these uh, more abstract ideas into something that is tangible or digestible um, by the broadest number of people. Yeah, and maybe as a comment to Laura, it's like I thought what was, uh, what I find about your project and uh, maybe also about the or original uh, Witches for Housework so interesting is not so much actually the, the demand itself, uh, which I think they was also not exactly meant literally in the 70s, right? It's not that they actually wanted to be paid, but it, what, what, it, what, it, what it functioned uh, amazingly was to, to basically reveal the infrastructure, the system, exactly. right? To show how things are, you know, how, how women are exploited and to, to point that out with a, with a fervor, right? With, with a lot of energy is I think what, what brought this, uh, is also so amazing about your project. Do you have any questions out there? Please. Yeah? And more, we collect more if there are more. Oh, hello. Hi, uh, thank you very much for three very interesting talks. My question is a bit related to um, the workers inquiry method that was developed initially by, in the 70s by Romano Quati. 
uh, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of recent work done by groups like uh, Kalinko uh, Call Centers, Inquiry, Angry Workers in the logistics sector at the moment trying to work out um, forms of resistance or new types of bargaining or whatever within the workplace but without union structures in a more kind of individual sense but um, it seems that like despite kind of a will to kind of um, and you know to kind of create new forms of uh, resistance there is a problem of I think uh, creating sort of the right form um, it almost goes back to, in fact, uh, uh, what al Qati was trying to do, because uh, as um, I think it was Trevor was saying about the collective thing, I mean, there was a lot of experiments with this in Italy in the 1970s during the crisis, and al Qati was almost saying that, in fact, Gramsci's idea of the Workers' Council had actually been put into place. Uh, in a lot of factories in Italy in the 1970s. But in some ways, all they did was create like collectives that were almost like the individual, if you see what I mean, that still had to be engaged within the economic system. So I'm wondering what is there kind of like on more like an effective uh, personal level, this maybe goes to um, Laurel's talk, uh, like maybe something like the human strike or an effective strike is there also possibilities for something like this or are there possibilities for collectives that don't just organize maybe with better rights but like uh, originally like a, a critique of uh, the workers council movement was by another guy who formed the communist party Bordiga said if there wasn't an insurrectionary antagonistic element to the collectives, then there was all they did was re recreate, in fact, even kind of save capitalism to a certain extent. Well, this, in a way, was the, your questions exactly was like the center point of this conference in November, which was basically thinking about looking at, let's say, Mechanical Turk uh, with the Amazon Mechanical Turk workers or this gig economy as a whole. What you are losing is a representation to unions as well, right? Not only the rights, but also the union representation, who, which largely uh, doesn't care, certainly about the digital workers, but they really didn't get a way of, uh, uh, f they didn't find a way of uh, accounting for those, protecting those, reaching out to those. So what do workers do, right, on Odesk or on rent coder or all of these pl uh, platforms, which really accounts in the U.S. for millions of workers. I mean, this is not a, this is not a small occurrence. And uh, so what we found is basically, so there is a freelancers union in the U.S., but you also have a lot of experiments with mutual aid uh, which start from uh, uh, Firefox plugins that allow workers to unite, uh, connect uh, on uh, Mechanical Turk and compare, uh, point out uh, empl quasi-employers that basically pay late or don't pay at all uh, and basically sort of mark these black sheep. Right? So it's like evaluation systems, uh, which is not, it's not nothing to do with the union, but it is somehow bringing workers together uh, with these tiny design, t tiny design interventions, you know, uh, to help them out. And I don't think there's like one central answer, but it's really just like a whole sort of sprawling of experiments uh, with possibilities. Uh, one thing that I've thought a lot about taking wages for housework as a starting point is in the 70s, that was a demand against a state. Um, but of course, if we were to take seriously the demand of wages for Facebook today, that would be a demand against a corporation. So thinking a little bit more from the perspective of a user, I think there's kind of a rich area for subversion there in that on some level, a corporation has to please its customers. And I'm thinking of things like um, when Instagram um, it was bought by Facebook, I believe, and changed its privacy policy, and there was kind of an instant uproar. And in fact, the, so many people decided to withdraw um, using from, from their use of Instagram that they immediately had to kind of respond by changing those. And I think it would be really interesting to see something like a history of user revolts charted. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, another kind of dimension to this, and I'm, I'm kind of gathering some of this from the type of things we're seeing again in, in Greece um, very recently. I mean, others in this room uh, can certainly speak uh, much more authoritatively on this than me. But the question I have uh, when we begin to talk about uh, labor cooperation is the kind of um, our role of the state 
uh, you know, coming back into play here. Um, uh, we can think of logistics, for example, as the multiplication of various sovereign entities, both um, you know, immaterial at the level of um, uh, software regimes, if you like, and then um, very concrete in terms of infrastructure and the type of ownership of those infrastructures. But then we do have instances where the movements can uh, intersect and push back onto the state, as we're seeing, at least for the time being, um, uh, within Greece. And, and also kind of play a role against some of the kind of non-state sovereign powers involved in, in these operations and economies. There's a question there. Yeah, um, Mr. Schultz, you had mentioned something um, when you're talking about platforms, the sharing economy platforms, Uber, Airbnb, etc. And you had mentioned something about Bitcoin mm -hmm. allowing some sort of way to take it away. Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, it's just a reference basically that you, which, uh, you know, this morning I met uh, with uh, programmers uh, here and we, we are talking about like making what it would take to make this uh, like open source platform uh, for cooperatives possible. And they said like, well, it really motivates programmers if they are paid. Um, and uh, of course, uh, that's true. So, you know, one thing to do would be, uh, of course, to do like a crowdfunding campaign to actually fund uh, the initial stage of that. And uh, in ways you could also do uh, with, I'm, I'm not a big proponent of Bitcoin actually, but with alternative currencies as well. Uh, but, you know, I was mainly more pointing to uh, uh, crowdfunding in general. And I'm not an expert on that, but I'm sure also uh, there are other innovative uh, ways of uh, raising funds through, through Bitcoin or other alternative occurrences. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Yeah, thank you for this really interesting talk. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you're linked to trade unions. I work for a trade union, actually I work for the trade union who organizes in Germany the workers at Amazon. And um, I think there is one important part uh, still missing, which I would like to discuss too, that is the problem how to enforce existing legal rights. Um, it is interesting how they give a shit about law, uh, those employers here in Germany. And um, it is really hard to organize the people, not uh, because they don't want to, but because they are threatened. And um, I think this is, this is just uh, an extra a little piece uh, in, this, in this whole game, which uh, I would like to discuss, and also what you think are the tools, um, because we are also setting up, we don't um, want to, um, well, we want to use the digital world for our uh, work, and uh, so I'm really curious and interested in uh, infrastructures we could use and set up. Uh, so if you have some more ideas and also the art part, I'm really interested in cooperations of this. Thank you. Shall we answer? I'm not sure. I thank you very much. I think that was quite an important statement because there are laws that are a lot of times um, not applied and that is threatening um, at those workplaces and it's very important to mention the union's work and two weeks ago here um, the radical philosophy conference was and it was amazing how interested and how full the panel on organization was and there seemed to be a return of this topic that we again need to organize ourselves and we are over the moment where we think technology is doing this job for us, but of course we need to do it with technology, as you said. It's true. Um, before we do the last round, maybe one more question. Can I say one word? Yeah. Well, okay. Sorry, Pip, he wants to say what? But you can in the last round. Okay, go ahead. Um, thinking back about um, to the late 90s, the um, dot-com crash, um, I was missing a bit to talk about uh, um, the stock market. Uh, the valorization of Uber compared to Facebook. I mean, whether real profits are being made are probably not to the labor, but rather to the uh, speculation on the stock market. And um, I don't know if, if there shouldn't be also a demand to become a stakeholder of that value, not just think in terms of in, in the valorization in terms of wages, but also in terms of property. 
because the, the real profits of Facebook are not being made through advertisement. This is more like legitimation to be basically more valuable on the stock market. Also Uber is uh, um, much more valuable as an asset in, on the stock market than re really as a, um, a taxi, taxi company. So um, one question, I mean also compared to the discussion of um, um, Tiziana Terranova talked about these new forms of valorization, how to contaminate that space and how to probably uh, uh, disrupt it or, or regulate it from, uh, from the workers' movement by redirecting the attention away from time and labor to the, f the area of ab abstract valorization and financialization. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. Uh, thank you for bringing it up, Pit. We we'll, um, take it up and we, at the same time, have the last round up here. Yeah, um, Pit, um, you know, you've identified, a, of course, a massive, massive um, problem related to financialization, the scale of financialization. Uh, something like, I mean, we hear about 80% of transactions are through high-frequency trading, right? Um, um, and, you know, what, what can one do, right? Um, we know that experience um, um, uh, is extracted, expropriated, um, uh, turned into data, and enters into the economy of derivatives even. Um, so, you know, for example, if we were to subtract experience from these algorithmic apparatuses, which then produce experience as data for the purpose of transaction, um, you know, what might that mean in terms of a scale, right, intervention at the level of scale? Not so much, right, unless, you know, how do you multiply the subtraction of experience? I'm not sure committing Facebook um, suicide kind of does that sufficiently. Uh, and I don't have no idea then what the response to that might be other than to, to think then the question of scale as it relates to the production of data through the kind of interpenetration of experience via these kind of um, algorithmic kind of machinic systems. Um, the other option, I guess, is something like this experiment we're hearing from our friends in Helsinki around um, Robin Hood, right? Um, uh, Robin Hood kind of um, collective, right? Which seeks to, you know, play stock and turn it back into a social wage for cultural production. It's something like this. But yeah, you know, how then do you know that you're not committing these heinous kind of crimes just through the participation in the finance market? I don't know enough about their work except to say we don't know, right, um, necessarily how the data has been broken up, re-aggregated, and turned into another kind of series of trades through derivatives and what kind of um, consequences that might hold um, at the level of um, um, how it touches the ground. You know, uh, I think there are a lot of kind of problems uh, potentially in that type of move as well. Except, you know, we need to think about this intersection, I think, precisely between frequent the cap, uh, trade and, and yeah. But just shortly, I mean, why is not an Uber driver like a stakeholder of the, of the, uh, um, of the stock of Uber? You know, when you're working for a company, why aren't you not getting a share of that company? That's what I mean, the Facebook campaign is great, but why didn't you put more attention on the stakeholdership? That basically every user should be become a co-owner of the of the company. Yeah. I mean, that this is a demand to basically for the work I do on Facebook. Why I'm doing one stock probably per user, you know, twenty dollars per year. You know, there's a value to it, and and why am I not becoming a shareholder of that company? Yeah. Well, maybe I mean, and just to answer quickly to this, but I definitely wanted to answer to the union comment as well. Uh, I mean, in, in that realm, I found uh, the uh, French tax proposal most interesting uh, in 2013, right? Uh, the Collin and Collin uh, proposal, uh, which basically uh, uh, scared the hell out of. Uh, you know, these, all these tech companies, which basically made this very logical argument, which basically said that in the old days, right, taxes would be charged where the headquarter of a corporation uh, is, uh, resides, right? Uh, but now, with Google having these tentacles all over the world, right, they are financializing French citizens, right? Google, Facebook, all of these companies. Uh, and so, why not charge uh, corporate tax on the, the gains that those companies gain from French citizens. I mean, of course, you could determine, you know, what that actually is not impossible at all, right? And that, like, really scared uh, these companies. So they were, like, in the airplane immediately to Paris, like, to uh, try to divert this. And then the French government screwed it up uh, on a sort of major level where this really, like, sort of 
was got in a cul-de-sac. But I thought the proposal, this I think, was a, a, a much better response than thinking a payers for our work, right? It's uh, because it's at least in a, in a social democracy like France, where you uh, have actually a chance to see this tax money reappear in social services. Uh, but then I wanted to say to the unions, you know, that actually Germany is really, uh, I invited the IG Metall to uh, New York because they uh, just published uh, this uh, book called Crowdwork and are actually pushing very heavily on this uh, area of uh, digital labor to an extent like no, not a single American union does. Uh, and uh, they brought this also uh, digital labor as a central point to the digital agenda, right, of the Bundestag. And I uh, have uh, press releases about that. So actually the German, also the Verband der uh, uh, Gewerkschaften here in, in uh, Berlin, uh, in Germany, uh, uh, issued also press releases to that effect, basically emphasizing the importance of digital labor and the well-being of the worker in digital environments. So, in the German environment, seem, people seem to be much more aware of that, at least uh, the IG Metall for sure is. Yeah. Verdi, Verdi would be the one, right? I would say that, but in, fa in this fact, I see more uh, momentum from. <laughs> so Germany is not just bringing um, a global uh, mistrust and surveillance into the global discourse, but also the unions are, um, as we just learned, role models when it comes to digital labor. Yeah, I guess, you know, one reason for looking backwards and taking as a starting point a kind of text from the 1970s and a different moment in time is in a way to kind of embody this sense that I think, you know, this is nothing new. This is pure, repeti pure repetition. And I think, you know, we do have to really think carefully about how to ask a younger generation for whom these kinds of processes um, and platforms are naturalized to understand the dynamics of things like labor history. And I think, you know, presenting technology not always as the constant new, but as something that has a lot of precedence um, and a lot of political precedence in terms of how we could struggle against it um, is something that I think is really important today. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for all three speakers up here on the panel. Thanks, Trevor, Ned, and Laurel. Um, it was very nice and interesting for me. Um, I thank you all in the audience for bearing with us and staying here. And I would like to use the occasion to thank the Transmediale, who did a really good job this year, I think, um, and provided us with a really, really good conference. So thank you. <laughs>